I'm not, I'm not someone who likes routine, <laughs> even though routine is good. Right? Let, me, let me explain that. Routine in and of itself is not evil. It's not evil in itself. It's just if it, it, can be, it can be confining and not allow you to flow with the Spirit. You can get so stuck on routine that you, the Spirit has no place to move. And we're asking him to interrupt, but what he's asking us is to surrender. Those two don't go together, right? If he wants us to surrender and we're going, no, you interrupt us and we'll know, then that doesn't go together. And, 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 and the problem is we don't know what surrender is. You know, I mean, we use terms that we really haven't never defined. Surrender can mean 20 different things to 20 different people. <clears throat> I believe in this hour, God is raising up the priestly ministry again. Now, we got a, by the way, Friday night, the house um, was awesome. Uh, many people were there. It was great. We're going to do another one on the 9th of April, 7 o'clock, fireside chat. We are having chats about the priestly ministry. We're, we're literally, I, I feel like in this hour, the Lord wants me to raise up a uh, people who want to know how it is to govern the affairs of God. He invites us literally to, to come into his courts and govern. It's in scripture. I, I'll, I will be teaching all this on Friday nights and, and that kind of thing. And we can have very good churches, but still not impacting our city. You know, because we have to learn how to come in and hear what God's saying. You know, the word priest is a really interesting term because we really don't when God calls Melchizedek the priest of the Most High, it's the first time it's mentioned. So now what we have to do with Scripture is you have to take that word and you have to go through Scripture from beginning to end and watch him unfold what the priestly means. And the Levitical priesthood was never God's desire. Did you know that? He never wanted a one, he did not want one tribe of Israel to be priest. He actually called the whole company up the mountain. They were all to be priests. But what happened was they refused and they said, let us not draw near God. Moses, you do it. We'll listen to whatever he tells you. You know, that didn't work then and it doesn't work now. Why? Because it's, it's, it, he's not looking, he doesn't, have a, he doesn't want a chain of command. <laughs> that everyone is getting orders from, he wants to be able to uh, talk to you personally. Doesn't mean we all have the same level of authority, but I really believe this. I believe that too many of the church looks at ministers and goes, well, that's for them. I did that, by the way, 30 years ago. I didn't think God would, you know, I wasn't even thinking I could ever be called by God. I was just lucky that God, I was just happy that God saved me. You know, I was so far lost. I had no, I had no, um, of course, I grew up Catholic, so I wasn't going to become a priest that way. That wasn't because when I got saved, I was already married, so that wasn't going to happen. And, and so I never, I didn't grow up with a lineage. I grew up with a father who was cheating on my mother for 10 years. I found myself in all kinds of sin, and, and, and all I wanted to do was uh, meet the one who saved me. And I, I, and I know, like, I met Jesus. And then I met Holy Spirit. And then three years after that, I met the Father. I had an encounter with the Father. And I, and I think what happens to a lot of us, maybe you're listening on Facebook, maybe you're not. <laughs> then you won't hear this. Is... We don't realize that in the kingdom, we still have low self-esteem. We still don't understand that grace began 
the day, the moment that this is the first evidence of grace on your life. There's grace that's general. God makes the sun rise and sunset. He brings rain in the season. That's the general grace. But I'm talking the specific grace is the day that you heard the message of the gospel. Because he actually has to call out your name in heaven for you to hear the gospel. No one can say Jesus is Lord yet by the Holy Spirit. So you don't even realize that even before you were saved, Holy Spirit was present so that you could say, Jesus, you're my Lord. You couldn't even say that unless Holy Spirit was present in your life. We don't understand grace. So people think, I don't have any grace. I don't have a grace. They have grace. Now watch, there are people who, who have more grace. Say more grace. more grace. How do they get more grace? That's the question. How do you go from grace to grace? The Bible says that we go from faith to faith and grace to grace. How, how do we do that? How do we just, well, number one, I, I, this is what I had to tell myself. I'm going to give you a little confession. <laughs> I used to walk in a room and think everyone was talking about me. Not that they were talking good about me, that if there were three people in the room, they must be saying something bad about me. My esteem was that low. <clears throat> then I had to come to some conclusions. I'm not that important that they are spending their time talking about me. That was the first thing I had to come, but that wasn't good enough. Why? Because then, but that still didn't take, that still created low self-esteem. I have no value. Anyone ever feel like you have no value? I certainly did. I I, I really, really did. And and what what I discovered, and this is why the church is trying to get the people, we're always talking about God loves you. How many people have heard that message in the last 20 years? He never, the question never, well, it is. It is in the beginning, does God love me? The question he asked me was, do you love me? Now, you know, my wife and me, we have different love languages. You ever read the five love languages? My wife is uh, is acts of kindness. I try to tell my kids. When your mother, because they're starting to move out on their own, your mother is always going to be your mother. She's always going to ask what you need. Just give her something. It's her, it's her, it's how she expresses love. Is she does something. She, she's always done that. My wife is not the person that tells me she loves everyone 50 times a day. She's the one who does 50 things a day. That's her love language. Mine's affection, touch. I love hugging. Some people have a problem with that. Don't come to an Italian and think we don't like hugging. Okay, we do. Okay, do. I admit it. You could do it without being perverted, by the way. I love, I, I, get, I had someone get upset because, well, you only hug women. I don't think that's true. I hug Phil. I hug Jerry. Jerry gives me big bear hugs. He's a big, good bear hugger. I've seen him hug a couple of bears. It's pretty impressive. But It's our love language. But you know what? What is God's love language? Have you ever asked that? No, it's not everything. It's obedience. Those who love me are those who keep my commandments. That's, that's God's love language. And I found myself miserably uh, void in expressing my love properly to Jesus. And I, by the way, I also knew this. I couldn't do it. There's this tension where God says, be obedient. And then there's a sacrifice of Jesus knowing I won't be. Like knowing that regard. Now, I don't need Jesus, by the way, I don't need Jesus because I won't be obedient. I need Jesus because I was born of a sinful flesh and I need a sacrifice. That's the number one right. We think we need Jesus because we're never going to be obedient. That shouldn't be the case, right? Shouldn't be the case. But we, the church makes it that way. We begin to, because I don't know about you, I don't feel good when I'm disobedient. Does anyone feel good when they're disobedient? Does that help your self-esteem? It doesn't help mine. I found this out in the beginning, right? For the first three years, I, I, I had bad thoughts. I had bad actions. And, and I, 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 was, I was looking for more than being forgiven. You know, Charles Finney, would walk into factories and the whole fact, he just went to go see his friend's factory and the whole factory repented. 
They all came to Christ. He walked in. He was just, his friend wanted to show him his new factory. So he brought them in. And all of a sudden, everyone's on their knees, worshiping God, repenting of their sins. But he went 25 years before he realized he could be sanctified in Christ. If you read his book, it was like 25 years later, he has a, a, a second baptism of fire comes upon him. And he gets transformed. And he says, for 25 years, I was kind of praying just to fight off everything. Do you know what priest, and it's, if you follow the priesthood, if you follow the, the understanding of the priesthood, I'm writing a book on it right now, so this is on my heart, but it's one that ministers, but it's, that's such a bad understanding. That's what, the, that's what it says if you look in the concordance. You know, if you read the word and go to the Hebrew, it says one who ministers, one who officiates. That's not actually what the essence of it. You know what it is? You know what a priest is? Someone who draws near. Priests are those who draw near to God. Now, who is that reserved for, if not as people? It's not for the minister. It's not for the apostle or prophet or pastor, teacher, evangelist. It's not for them. It's for everybody. But we get caught into this trap of they have special grace upon them. I do not have special grace to draw near. I have special grace to be an apostle. But I do not have special grace to draw near. That is a myth. We have the same grace to draw near. <clears throat> we have to understand what my grace on my life is for. Where Margaret's got the grace. Margaret and Kathy are both prophets. They have the grace on them as prophets. But, that, but they have the same grace to draw near. God didn't sit, God has, I, I, this is the real struggle we have. God has never said no to anyone who comes to him in faith. And you really can't come to him unless you come in faith. You won't get past the first set of locks on the door, right? If you don't believe in Jesus, you aren't drawing close. There's only one way, regardless of what people might say. There's only one way. And one of the biggest things we struggle with in the church is not realizing that God is actually saying to you, how close do you want to come? That's scary. He is the unapproachable light. And yet he says, come. I want you to think about that for a second. See, we, we, we sometimes, we, 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 we know 1 Corinthians 1 says, not many noble we know that. And then we look at them in all their glory at the end of their ministry and we go, but that isn't me. I can't. I mean, do you think Peter measured up when God called him? You think there was like, he went, oh, this is the one. Like he did. By the way, he did. You know what? He looked into him and saw his destiny, read his scroll and called him. By the way, there were many Jesus called who did not come. Some had to go bury their parents. Some had to go say goodbye to their parents. Some had other things to do, the cares of the world, the riches and all this. They, but there was many disciples that turned away from Jesus. Isn't that stunning? So, by the way, so... <laughs> what is it that is holding you back? from coming as close as you will. Now, wait, you, I, I love to tell you that you could just run in today and go as close as you want. It'd kill you, so don't do that, you know. But it, there is a process, right? And in that process, he begins, because I could not handle all grace poured out of me in one moment. I, look, Margaret's been with me when God touched me in 07 in Webb, Alabama. And I was on the ground for 30 minutes as electricity shut down. me. That's about, you know, there's only so much you can take of God's presence before you're just might as well go. And, and I, that was the first time I really experienced it to that level where it was almost painful. And I remember reading about Rodney Howard Brown, Benny Hinn, Bill John, all these people talking about these encounters with God and them all saying, God, if you don't lift, it's going to kill me. Ron A.R. Brown, it was three days. He finally said to God, if you don't lift, you're going to kill me. How much grace do you want? How much of his presence you want? You might not be called to be an apostle, but who knows? 
God hasn't, isn't done with you yet. Might not be called to be a prophet. Who knows? But this, see, we're, the church struggles with, what am I to do? Well, do what Jesus told us to do. Spread our faith, all that stuff. But the number one thing you must do is draw close. That's different for everybody because everyone's in a different journey. Even though it's the same road, <laughs> it's still a different journey. My, my, my struggles might not be your struggles. Maybe, you, you know, I always tell Bill, when I'm with Bill, I go, you know, Bill, tell me about your great, 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 great uncle who carried the uh, wineskin for Jesus when they went to the, the disciples' house. You know, because Bill, Bill's got this heritage, seven generations, right? Yeah. I don't have that heritage. But I'm still on the same road. Jeremiah 6 says, ask for the ancient paths. It actually says that in the Holman translation of the Bible. I think it says old paths. It probably says, I think, in, in the um, New King James. But the word is actually ancient pathways, by the way. That, that is the highway of holiness. That is the road he has built for me and you to journey close to him. And holiness is not just a set of rules. I can give you rules. You can do rules. Religious people love rules when they pat themselves on the back. Not that rules are, rules are, rules are not bad. Like, you know, um, learning right and wrongs are not bad because there's wrong stuff that's just not going to work. <clears throat> I, I, had, I had some girls in my car one time trying to advocate to me that Jesus loves homosexuality. I said, of course he does. But it's not acceptable. And I said to them, would you be okay if I was having an affair? Well, No. So why is sexual sin okay for someone else and not for me? Sin, sin. There are some rules to the game. But in and, in and of itself, those rules don't make me holy. Holiness, listen, holiness deals with the proximity to the Lord. Let me say that again. Holiness deals with the proximity to the Lord. In other words, how close you come, the more you're transformed, the more you carry his presence, the more you impact those around you, the more you bring the miracle working of God. We go, but it's faith. No, faith is for coming in. <laughs> no one has faith. No one has a lack of faith when they've seen Jesus. Faith isn't the issue when we see him. Thomas had unbelief until he saw Jesus. Once he saw Jesus, there wasn't an issue of faith anymore. I mean, he goes to India and he gives his life and ends up dying there for the cross. He, he, he had an encounter when he saw Jesus that changed his life, right? We, we, we sit here, I want, you, I want to tell you this. Jesus does not want you just to go by testimony alone. He wants you to see him. That scares you, doesn't it? Well, that's for apostles. No, it was for 500 on the mountain. They weren't all apostles. It was for everybody. He, he, has literally, uh, he literally has ordained for all of us to hear his voice and to see his face. Because we're priests. Remember, we're a royal priesthood. Which gives me two very, very significant understandings of this priesthood. Number one, you have been born into royalty. Royalty acts differently than non-royalty. There have been recently a prince and princess who didn't understand that and walked away from royalty and are upset because royalty had a way to walk. You mean I have to curtsy before the queen? Yes, you better bow before the king too. There is a way. That's, that's man's way. I'm just telling you God's way. There is, there, is a, there is a way to come in to the king. And, and, and here's the thing. Is he, just so you know, I've been chastised enough in this process. Um, this is part of the process. People don't like that. They're like, God loves me. I know. The more he loves me, the more he chastises me. That's what the scripture says. 1995, a prophet named 
Rick uh, said to me and Kathy, we walked into a prophetic meeting in a home group and he just stopped us and called us out. And he said, Proverbs 3, 1 through 13, read it every day. And the end of that says, the Lord corrects the one he loves. Oh, I found that to be true. <laughs> so I'm going to let you know beforehand that as you draw close, you're going to learn his love language. You're going to learn what is acceptable to him. He does not accept everything. He accepts you. He accepts everyone who comes. He does not accept everything we do. Does that make sense? I have three kids. I love them. I don't accept everything they do. I love them regardless. They know. My daughter definitely knows I love her. She uses that against me whenever she needs anything. <laughs> Told her that when she was born and been paying for that one ever since. So she's back there. She knows I'm, I love her. I always say to her, why will I do it? Because you love me. Yep, that's, that's the game. You know why God will answer your prayers? Because he loves you. This is, the priestly ministry is not about your prayers getting answered. It's not about that. He answers us because we're his children. He already knows what I have need of before I even ask him. So ask me. He says ask. But you don't have to use long, rep repetitious things when you're asking him for your needs because he already knows what you need for that day. But he says ask. Why? Because we're building that relationship of I'm depending on you for everything that goes on this day, every day. And he says, for your desires, you have to ask and you have to knock and you have to seek. But he says, even the, even the judge turned, you know, finally gave to the woman who was pounding on his door, please just, he says, how much more your heavenly father will give you those things you desire? Stunning. It's not about, the priesthood is not about answering prayers. The priesthood is about the affairs of the king. Not about your affairs. I can come before him in an instant when I have a need. Instant, I can pray. He hears me. He doesn't have to go through the ceiling in here. I have the Holy Spirit with me. He is, he's not, he is not like God. He is God. When I pray in tongues, it, it's not, I, some people go, well, I feel like my prayers, I feel like I got brass ceilings. Old Testament philosophy. Not new. By the way, he was talking about the rain. He wasn't talking about your prayers. Okay? Jesus just said, ask your father for those things you need. Ask. Some people think the priesthood is like earning answered prayer. It's not. It's not about earning answered prayer. He answers. He so loves us. He, he will answer all our prayers. Now, it doesn't mean that what we're asking, he might not. Um, he might go, yeah, that's a really good one. I've been waiting for you to ask that. Now, let me adjust you so you can carry the very blessing you're asking for. If you don't know how to pay your bills, giving you a home might not be the right answer. Right? If you don't know how to pay your bills, if you don't know how to do the basic things, learn those things. You know, you prepare for those things. You might teach you those things. I don't want to learn those. I believe God's just going to bless me. All right. All right. Let me know how that works out for you. But the priestly is about what are you doing in the earth? Why is this important? Because Saturday night, 6 p.m. began Passover. Now, I'm not going to eat the meal. I believe Italians should actually cater the Passover meal. I think it's a lot better. But during the feast, it's important that you listen to what he is saying. Because he has got a pointed feast where he speaks about what he is doing in the earth. And sometimes it has nothing to do with what you are thinking about that moment. <clears throat> this the prophets understand. That's why the prophets pay attention to the feast. Because they know that's a time where God would speak to Israel as a whole. <clears throat> they would literally, by the way, if you don't know this, during the Yom Kippur week, they had to find out whether or not they repented enough, whether or not they were going to live under blessing for the next year or cursing for the next year. Huh, wouldn't that be fun? <clears throat> Draw near to him. Draw near to him. 
It says, look at the scriptures are clear. The script, if you understand this principle, like I try to tell people, I, I said this Friday night, pay attention to patterns in the scripture. God always moves in patterns. He doesn't move by methods. In other words, you can't learn the pattern and go step one, if I do this, then I get to do step two. You can't do that. But you can see what he's doing in patterns. Pay attention to threes. Pay attention to six. Pay attention to sevens. Pay attention to eights. Pay attention to nines. Pay attention to 15 because uh, Yom Kippur, I think, no, Feast of Tabernacles and uh, the sacrifice are both on the 15th of the month. Pay attention. They both deal with grace. Revelation says this, grace from the Father, grace from the Spirit, and grace from the Son. Three fives, 15. Pay attention. Pay attention to 10 times, 10 times 10. Dimensions of the most holy place. That's why it says God will bless you a thousand times. It's actually saying God has infinite blessing for you. First, second, third heaven. The word third, gemil, the word third, gemil in Hebrew, actually means the place of his infinite supply. So God always moves in patterns. He's always, and if you learn the patterns, and he, so, I, so I want to talk to you. This has all been an introduction, by the way. I, I feel like the Lord wants me to release on you this morning the spirit of wisdom and revelation and understanding. Now, I'm going to explain to you what that is, okay, who that is. And it's the Holy Spirit and it's angelic help. Say angelic help. Remember when Daniel was sitting there and he has a vision and he says, I turned to the one next to me and said, what does this mean? And he explained it to him. That was the spirit of understanding. <clears throat> we just don't understand this because, oh, we shouldn't talk to angels. No, you better talk to angels if they come talking to you. Nowhere in Scripture does it say don't talk to angels. Well, God, all I need is the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit sent Paul an angel. So figure it out. He sent Peter an angel. He sent Jesus angels. He sent Daniel angels. He's, I mean, you know, we, we've come up with this philosophy. Well, we have, the, we have the Bible now. That's all we need. No, the Scripture doesn't say that. Well, you have the Holy Spirit. Yep, doesn't say we only need the Holy Spirit. He's got, he, he, has, he has ways of speaking that we have to open up ourselves up. Now, people go, well, if I open myself up to that, Am I open myself up to the demonic? I got news for you. If you close yourself to it, you're open to the demonic. Okay? Whatever you shut off from the kingdom, counterfeits will come in. In other words, if I sit there and say, you know, <laughs> I'm not, I, no, I, I, we don't realize that there's actually a spirit behind saying no to the Holy Spirit. Germany in the 1910s, 1920s, made a, the, all the pastors made a covenant deal that they would not allow what was happening in Azusa Street in Wales to come into their nation. They didn't believe in the Holy Spirit, the third, third person of Godhead. They were not going to teach the doctrine. They actually signed an agreement, a charter against it. What rose up was an antichrist spirit in the body of Hitler that actually went after the Jews. When you reject anything of God, it's not to protect yourself. You're actually going to bring damage long-term to yourself. That's what happens. The opposite comes in there. Turn to Ephesians chapter uh, 1. You know the verse 17 and 18. We're going to go there. What is revelation? A lot of times we get stuck at revelation. We just get stuck there. Well, I got a revelation. How many people know we love talking about revelation? By the way, I love Revelation. How many people want to go deeper than the revelation, though? And you just say yes. That's not a trick question. Just say yes to that, okay? What happens is sometimes we don't know what to do after revelation. I'm going to tell you what I've done. This might work for you. It might not. You might have a different process. I'm just going to tell you what's worked for me, okay? All I can do is testify to myself or to you the things that God has done and worked for me. I don't like teaching things that God has not worked in me because it's just knowledge. It's not, it doesn't have an anointing I can transfer. So I want to be able to transfer that anointing to you. Okay. So I can only do it in the, you know, in the mechanism or in the, in the revelation of how he's worked it through me. Okay. 
September 16, 2004, I went up to my, I call my uncle, Greg Raley, and I was just hungry for a word from God because I was making some major decisions in my life. And I said, um, I said to Randy, my father and the Lord, I said, hey, tell Randy, uh, tell Greg, if he's got a word for me, I am really hungry for God, for a word tonight. You know, and I don't do that often. That's, that doesn't happen a lot. I go, I need a word, but I just couldn't get breakthrough. I had so many people giving me counsel that, you know, I just had to stop. I literally just had to stop with all the counsel. And I would, I would ask people, is that the Lord or is that your opinion? I need to know. And they were like, well, it's just, no, okay, I don't need that. I had so much of that. I could have filed, I could have filled up a six foot high file cabinet of all the opinions of what I should do. And some were on this side, no. And some on this side were yes. And, and it, it just got to the point where the multitude of noise was drowning out what I needed to hear. And it was up to me just to go, no, by the way, this is what Greg Rowe prophesies over me. Literally prophesies this word over me. There's people on the left saying, yes, yes. People on the right saying, no, no. But you've halted. By the way, the scripture says, you halted between two opinions. <laughs> and, I, and Greg gives me this word, and it was so spot on. And that's why, you know, it's really good to know people who can really hear. <clears throat> and Randy was even amazed by the word. He was like, man, that was like, because Randy didn't go. We don't go up to people and go, this is what Lewis is struggling. He needs a word. We don't do that. We just go, he needs a word. See where God lands on that. Because I'd rather get what I need from the Lord than what I want from the Lord. I found that sometimes what I want is step three of a process that I'm not close to yet. And I might want to get what I need versus what I want in that moment. And the last thing that Greg prophesied over me was, and now the Lord releases to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and quick understanding. How many people want that? I can release that. Why? Anything God's done with me, I can release out. <clears throat> By the way, I pray this over myself to increase all the time. Like, I want more of this. It's one of the things I do have. I do, people are always talking to me about the revelation. I said, well, it was a grace given to me. A grace I will freely impart to anyone who wants it. Anyone who hungers for that grace, I am more than happy to pray for them. Matter of fact, often when I pray for people, I go, Lord, everything on my life, I just give it away. Just let him take it. I know none of us can. I have things that God's given me that I don't even operate in, but they're there for other people. God will show it to me. Remember that person laid hands on you? That was for this person 10 years later. Impart that gift. And they start functioning in it. Surprise from Africa has raised like 200 people from the dead. Bill Johnson asked them. Surprise, where did you get this anointing that raised the dead? Oh, Jack Taylor prayed for me. He calls Jack. He goes, Jack, surprise, it says he got the anointing to raise people from the dead from you. He says, I gave him too much, you know, because Jack, Jack has never raised anyone from the dead. But yet, he prayed over surprise. And see, sometimes we carry something. Sometimes we're just carrying something. Sometimes it breaks through someone else and we go, oh, I had that all along. I didn't know that. The word here when it says <clears throat> Paul, and you got to love Paul. Paul, now this is a church at Ephesus. By the way, this is probably one of Paul's favorite places he's been. He actually stays there two to three years. He weeps when he leaves in the book of Acts. He, he, he says, I didn't withhold anything from you while I was with you. Nothing. Everything the Lord gave me, I shared, I taught you. And the church at Ephesus is a very powerful church. It's, uh, you got to remember, you know, this is a church that's also, it's got its own um, uh, false worship. All the places in Asia Minor actually have temples to false gods. Some are to Caesar, because Caesar just wasn't a political figure or a ruler. He was actually something they believed to be deity and would worship. If you don't understand that, worship, Caesar's coins said on it, Lord of Lord and King of Kings on his coins. He would actually, some of the coins would say son of God on it. This is why in Revelation, Jesus in those regions that they're worshiping Caesar, he said, I'm the Lord of Lords. You think he's just saying a statement. He's not. He's saying, he's not, I am. And I'm going to prove it to you because this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to prove it to you by these things. But it doesn't do you any good if you have the spirit of revelation without understanding because then you go, <clears throat> it's like manna. You know what manna means? 
What is it? That's all it means. That's literally what they said. They woke up in the morning. They went, manna. What is it? That's what it means. You know where the revelation of, you know where the understanding of what it is came about? I am the bread your fathers did eat in the wilderness. That was the understanding of what was placed on the ground for them every morning. They were eating Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus said it. I didn't say it. I am the bread that your fathers did eat in the wilderness. Think about that statement. Huh. Huh. Melchizedek came with bread and wine and actually taught Abraham the order of Melchizedek priesthood. That's why Abraham goes into, learns how to go into the presence of the Lord and gets an encounter. And he, eventually he's faithful enough where God makes the covenant and then renews the covenant and then gives him the child, all that stuff. There was a process to it. That's, that's for another time. All right. <clears throat> he says this, verse 15, therefore I say, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, what is revelation? Revelation is just uncovering something. It's God taking, listen, it's not here. It's here. It actually is God removing something that lies on your heart that causes your heart not to see what God wants you to see. That's revelation. It's just him going, you didn't see this, but let me just pull back a veil. Oh, I didn't know that was there. Almost all revelation is the revealing of Jesus himself. Because in Jesus, Paul said he learned the gospel of the kingdom through the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, the more the Father, the more the Father, the Spirit, the more that the Spirit revealed to him who Jesus was, the more Paul was able to frame the gospel of the kingdom. He says, no man taught me, not even angels. The Spirit of, this is what he's actually saying. The Spirit of revelation and understanding revealed to me the kingdom. How many people would like that kind of revelation? How would you like to preach a gospel that, the, that, that you got through the revelation of Jesus Christ versus from some online, this is how you preach the gospel? See, when you, when you and God has, by the way, there, there is never... You can never exhaust the revelation of Jesus. Just when you think you've gotten there, you know, bam, there's a whole new, and then you'll spend five years just unfolding that revelation, unfolding the wisdom of it and who he is. See, what the problem, here's the problem we have in modern day church is we learn the language, but not, but we don't eat the substance. we learned that it was the bread that his fathers did eat without eating the bread. When Jesus is teaching them, he gives them the revelation. I was the bread. And he says, eat me, drink me, right? Eat of me, drink of me. But we don't do that. We don't know how to do that. We have the revelation of it, but we lack the wisdom and understanding of how to bring that into our lives. And start manifesting that. Now, I got a great, great lesson for you here. Is that the one who gave you the revelation also wants to give you the understanding and make it practical in your life for you. Just go back to the one who gave you the revelation. Even if I get the revelation, let's say Bill, Bill Johnson or Rick Joyner or somebody preaches something of revelation. I don't go to them to give me all their understanding. I go to the Bible. I begin, and I did that, and it was long, and it was painful at times. But I built the relationship with Holy Spirit that way. <clears throat> like my, my, look, I had a relationship with religion for 24 and a half years. I just didn't want it again. I didn't want, um, uh, you know, <laughs> I didn't want to be bored in church for an hour. 
I had done that for so long in Catholic Church, and, and I'm, not, I'm not against the Catholics because I got bored in Baptist Church too. I mean, I get, I, 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 I get, I, I was an air traffic controller, and even though air traffic control has routine, you know, we mix it up every day by throwing thunderstorms in, or, you know, a plane catches on fire. It just mixes it up, so every day is not identical. You know what I mean? I like that. I like the routine, but I like mixing it up. You know, that's the way I think the kingdom is. Like, there's a routine to it, but God likes mixing it up. So, you know, okay, you believe in Jesus, they get your water baptized, and then we'll lay hands on you for the Spirit. And then God mixes it up, and he pours out his Spirit on Cornelius' house, and then Peter goes, okay, let's get him baptized now. The pattern was there, but the order was different. God just likes mixing it up. Just so you know, he's Lord, not you. Just so you're always listening and what do we, and I love Peter's answer. Well, seeing God poured out his spirit, who can deny water? Why? Because water baptism is a big deal. Not like we make, Margaret's going to teach on that uh, in a couple weeks. We, we don't understand the, the, the deal with water baptism. We've made it, well, we're just being obedient in Jesus. No. Sorry, precious. I'm glad you're being obedient, but I want to give you the, we want you to have the revelation of what it means to be baptized in water. Amen? All right. So revelation is just that. What's wisdom? Well, wisdom is knowing what to do with it would help, right? <clears throat> wisdom is to build. Wisdom builds. If I have the wisdom of revelation, I can build upon a revelation. If I have wisdom of a revelation, I can build upon build with the revelation. <clears throat> Paul calls it, by the way, Paul says this, that he is a master builder. Why? Because the spirit of wisdom and revelation was upon him. But he also says that the knowledge of and that word knowledge, by the way, it's not this. That word knowledge is epinosis. That word knowledge is that you would get the knowledge through experience of the revelation, not just sitting there and going, okay, Revelation. Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Yes, he wants you to meet Jesus the Lord. He wants you to see how Jesus functions as Lord. He wants you, you know, how many, how many, how many of you have experienced the Lord Holy Spirit? Because he's also Lord. You know, it's, 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 he wants you to go, yes, healing is for today, but he wants you to experience healing for today. And if you're not sick, he doesn't go, well, that's too bad. You don't get, he wants you to go and give it to somebody so you can experience the anointing as it flows through you. I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen the mute speak. I've seen the lame walk. And if you had told me 30 years ago that I would see any of that, I would have told you you were nuts. Matter of fact, I was in a church that didn't even talk about it. We didn't talk about the kingdom. Kingdom was something Jesus was going to bring back when he came back. Now kingdom's a buzzword. Everyone says kingdom. By the way, 25 years ago, if you mentioned kingdom, you were one of those kingdom now people. I would tell people, yeah, I'm kingdom then, I'm kingdom now, and I'm kingdom come. That's where I'm at. I said, the he came with his kingdom. The increase of his kingdom has no end. I'm there. Whether you... Whether you walk in the truth or not, that's up to you, but that's where I'm at. I, I'm sorry. I saw it. I met him in it. I saw it displayed. I started seeing people healed before. I met Bill Johnson. I saw people healed when I was ushering. I didn't, I, I, I didn't have, one thing that helped me was I didn't grow up in church. I, 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 people are going to get mad at me, but you know, sometimes church puts barriers on us that God never intended. You could go to a church that says healing's not for today, and you don't realize the warfare you're going to do to now get rid of that. Depending how ingrained that has been into, you, into your psyche and your logic is, is how much you're going to have to fight out of that. Because that thought, you know, look, you go pray for someone, they don't go healed. You go, yeah, well, they told me healing wasn't for today. Kind of the enemy would like to reinforce that over and over again. 
if you've been told that you're a worm and you're a sinner saved by grace and you're no good, you are going to have to fight out of that. Because those thoughts will keep coming back. They've just been in your, they've been, they've been deep in you. You don't realize they didn't get in your mind, they got in your spirit. When they get in your spirit, you have to extricate them by the Holy Ghost. You have to replace those thoughts with the presence of God as he drives out this, this wickedness. Words in the scripture, the enemy's words are called arrows, poisonous words that pierce the heart of men. The helmet of salvation and the shield of faith are designed to stop the fiery darts. Which, what are the darts? Those are the words of the enemy. He has no authority unless he gets you to get into agreement with something he wants you to believe. So that's his only power. His only power is agreement. He has no power over those who don't agree with him. So don't give him any power. Let him, let him be a toothless lion walking the earth. That's why he has to look for who he can devour because he can't devour those who know that he is just a toothless lion. You understand that? He can't devour just anybody. He's got to look to see who he can, who is believing him. That knowledge he wants. So for me, huh, I, I, just, I just didn't have to go through all that. Because when I got saved, I, I wasn't a good Catholic, so it was easy to get rid of it. We didn't use the Bible, so I didn't have any pretext. As a Catholic, they don't teach the Bible like that. They, they don't go, this is the word of God. They don't really teach you doctrine. They basically teach you you're nothing. I wasn't good at going to the priest for confession. You know, they go, you got to say like, you know, five Hail Marys, five Our Fathers. Hail Mary was a little long. I didn't remember it. And I go, hey, can I just make them 10 Our Fathers? Yeah, the father would go, yeah, 10 Our Fathers. I negotiate my repentance. And if you're smart, you say the Our Fathers in the King James Version. It's very quick. You don't say it in the Amplified. You'll be there for an extra 10 minutes. Wasn't good at all that. I was good at a sinner. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed help. They had nothing to help me. <clears throat> Until I met Jesus. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hear about salvation. I met the Savior. Now, someone preached it for 30 seconds in a business meeting of a four-hour meeting, mentioned Jesus, and it stuck. I've been looking for two years. I've been reading the Bible for two years. I didn't know it was Jesus. It shocked me as much as it shocks the atheist. You know, the atheist knew more than I knew. I heard something the other day, like, can you be an atheist if there is no God? Um, you can't be. It takes God for you to be an atheist. And so I, I, I wasn't that guy. I wasn't, I, I'm here to tell you the greatest news in the world. God has called you. He hasn't called you to serve in church, even though you serve. But that's not, we do that to, to, so we bring the kingdom to others. That's, that's why we do that. We serve so we create an atmosphere and an encounter for others who walk in to feel the presence of God who otherwise don't know how to access it. So there, there's a place that they can go to. Okay? It's not for the sake of this is when you get to come in before God. But there is something that I can, oh, I, there, there is a level I only reach in corporate atmosphere that I do not reach in personal prayer. And God reserves that for the corporate because a living stone builds no houses, but he takes all living stones and fits them together. I do not make up a house in and of myself. I am a living stone. I need other stones. Do you understand that? The corporate body is actually where it's at, not the individual. Sometimes we, 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 we need both. There's both have their purpose, but if you do the individual right, when you come corporately, living stones are fitted together in the, in the spirit, and you'll find that the presence of God begins to move mightily in the people. <clears throat> well, let's, let's, 
Let's go to verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Those eyes are here. Your spiritual eyes, your, your heart. Not, your, not these eyes. See, when Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and believe, he is not saying you're not supposed to see. He's saying, blessed are those who when it's preached, they believe. But then after that, you're supposed to see. He desires for you to see him. How do we start seeing him? We see him in praying for the sick and they recover. By the way, you have to learn what an encounter is. An encounter is not always you getting caught up in seeing angels. Encounter is when I walk into a business and God gives me a word for someone. And I go over to them and I begin to share that word and they begin to get touched by God. I just encountered God. You know, they encountered I encountered him too because he came through me. If I learn to recognize that encounter, um, then I get to have more encounters. We're always looking for the angels. By the way, I've seen angels. Not knocking it. I enjoy it. But I don't, it, it's not, um, it, 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 it's, <clears throat> we get trapped by our own lack of understanding of an encounter. Why is it when Jesus healed people, all the praise went up to God? Not to Jesus. It says that he came in the house, Matthew, uh, Mark 2, and he started healing the sick, and the people began to magnify God and glorify God. Why? Because they realized they encountered the Father. They realized that God was in their midst moving. I'm sure some of them began to wonder, is he the one? Can you imagine what this day was like almost 2,000 years ago? They don't know what you know. They don't have the history of what's going to happen in a week and him be resurrected. They don't have the Pentecost yet. They don't have any of that. They've been following Jesus now for three plus years and he comes into the city which he said, it's time to go to Jerusalem because it's not fit for any prophet to die outside the city. So he tells them, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. They, they, don't, they don't catch it. Some of them go, let's go with them. You know, like, hey, all right. You know, they're all going to be in a little bit. Can you imagine what it was like today, 2,000 years ago, when they all come in the city and they're worshiping, Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus knows where he's going. They don't. <clears throat> it, it was most likely for Jesus the beginning of sufferings the moment he enters the city. They're all praising him and he knows he is about to head to the cross. He didn't like it. He was hoping the father had another plan, maybe. Been gone for a little while, Father. Maybe you got another. Maybe, 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 Father, like Abraham, you have another. Maybe you have another cup. Maybe, maybe you can pass this cup and you have a way of. Maybe it's something you've hidden from me for this hour, just to see if I would be obedient unto death. When he's on the cross and he says. Why have you forsaken me? That wasn't a line. He felt forsaken. Why? Because if he didn't feel forsaken, then there was no price for you. <clears throat> I told him on Friday night that the interesting thing about myrrh, which was um, very costly, it's a very costly fragrance, but the way that you extract myrrh, it's resin that comes out of trees, is they wound the tree over and over again until the resin comes out. That's Jesus. They wounded him. They beat him until the very fragrance of the king, the sacrifice came out of him. 
They don't know this. <laughs> they don't know this. Jesus knows. He knows what he's going to go through. <clears throat> he knew his purpose. He, he knew. But it says, for the joy set before him, he endured it. He didn't say, for the joy of the cross, he endured it. He said, for the joy that was set before him. What was that joy? What was that joy? No, that joy was pleasing Father. It was total pleasing. He lived to do his business. He lived for him. He says, my meat is to do the work of my Father. This is my meat. This is my substance just to be about my father's business. When I was 12, I wanted to get right into it. And I was just a little bit early. And God just pumped the brakes a little bit. And then I had come to such a place of obedience that I argued with my mother whether or not this was my time. Woman, what does this have to do with me? It's not my hour hasn't come yet. Talk to your son. See, Revelation is absolutely so glorious. It's the candlestick, by the way. So this is how I process Revelation. God speaks to me. This is how it happens to me. Now, it can come two ways to you. God speaks to me and shows me things. Like When he speaks to me and, and I'm willing to turn myself aside to his voice, then God begins to give me um, visions of it. Some people, it's the other way. You get a vision, and then God speaks to you. How many people know that? That's okay. That's a pattern, but we're not doing methods here, right? Step one, two, whatever it is, but that's just how he does it to me. I, and I can have that revelation. He could speak to me sometimes in the night. Like, if I have a dream, 99% of my dreams with him is not about him. He actually comes to me in my dream and talks to me. Now, that happened after Bill Johnson laid hands on me. Before that, I'd get dreams and I'd have to go, what does that mean? And what I'd have to do is I'd have to go in scripture and I go, you know, what is, what's that imagery? By the way, you'll find that if you really read the Bible a lot, you'll find that a lot of the imagery is in here. By the way, the book of Revelation, 300 of the images are all found in the scriptures. 666 is found in the scripture. Just so you know, it's not the Antichrist. It's the number of a man. The beast is an empire not the Antichrist. It's found in Daniel. <clears throat> the candlestick, the seven spirits, all that imagery is in the scriptures. <clears throat> and so I have to, it's my job <clears throat> when I get the revelation to now turn aside with the Holy Spirit and then search it out. It's my job. I, I just can't, I don't get it by just, by the way, I don't, maybe you do. I do not get it by just going, okay, give me more. Like, it's like a diligent part. I might, like, he, for me, it's like, I'm going to unfold it to you. And then that's when scriptures come alive that I never saw before. You ever read something for like 20 years and he shows you something, you go, I never saw that before. It happens to me a lot, by the way. I tell people this, if if God did that every time you read the word, you would still be in Genesis chapter one. We're, we, have to, we have to understand like what God says in Genesis, when he says that is good, that it's good. It wasn't just his approval of what he was doing. He was stopping the, the creation process of it. That day came to an end that process of what he was doing. It could have lasted a million years. We have no clue. What God hasn't been around for, you know, man hasn't been around for 6,000 years. Scientists know this. The Bible actually declares it. There was no sun and moon until the fourth day. So what constituted a day before the sun and moon were created, which is why by what we measure a day. It had to do with what the day was over when he was done creating what he spoke in that day. And it had come to its place where that is good. Like you're telling your kids to clean your room and you go in there and they've 
done enough and you go, that is good. You haven't said that yet to your kids? Yeah. That one does, that doesn't, that doesn't come a lot with boys. That doesn't come a lot, does it? No. I wasn't that way. I was a kid who cleaned his room. Because I got bored in my room. It was like 10 by 10. And I would go, Where, how can I move this stuff around to make it look like I got a new room? Because I get bored in my room. Like, I'm mean, probably a little OCD or something. I don't know. ADD, OCD, HMI. I don't know. I don't, something. I don't know. Well, whatever they call it. I don't know. <clears throat> and so it's my job. And as I do that, the Lord begins to reveal to me. I begin to uh, track him, track what he's saying. I, I take notes. I, I go through my Bible. I go through, by the way, I go through several translations. I look up the Hebrew Greek. I do all that. And I'm going to try to see. And, you know, you can find, like, I'll go, oh, wait a minute. That's somewhere else in the Scripture. And I begin to find it. I begin to look at it and begin to undercover it. But now my heart is, now, by the way, that's the showbread. The showbread is the bread of his word and the bread of his face. Presence comes from the same, presence and face come from the same root words. You can't be in his presence without being in his face, and you can't be in his face without being in his presence. Okay? Now, most people don't know that. They think that they're going to see God when they're face to face. Moses didn't. Why do you think you should? God knows better than to have us do that because he knows that our tendency is to, you know, try to write a book on it and tell everyone this is what God looks like and everyone will try to create, a, you know, eventually someone will carve an image out of gold or, you know, do something and they'll be worshiping the image. He knows that. So he's very careful with that. Matter of fact, you really can't see God. Jesus said no one's seen God except for him who first ascend, who, him who ascended is the one who descended and no one saw God but Jesus. Think about that for a second. He's the unapproachable light. All you would see was is glory. I don't know about you, but that's frightening. And he's the one who's saying, come. Huh. And then what I do is I begin to talk God. This is the, ta- this is the uh, altar of incense. That's our prayers. And that's the table of communication. And this is where I go, God, I got it. To where I think I got it. You know why God gives you revelation? He wants to release the revelation in the earth. It's not just him. He is doing it on a personal level, but it's the personal level so I can make it known. Now to you, that might be, for me, making it known meant I had like two people at my kitchen table in the beginning. I didn't have a church. I didn't have a ministry. I just, you know, I would have, you know, I had this one, uh, one kid, you know, son, he got saved and he ended up living with us and we would stay up until three o'clock in the morning and go through, read out loud the book of Galatians. And we would be there for like five hours, just going through the word of God. I would just share what I knew. Your faith with a little God gives you more. I've tracked this process. This is the thing I talk to other leaders about. Tell me about the process. Cause we don't like talking about the process. No one asks, when, they go, when you go out to a restaurant, I don't care, let's say Capitol Grill. Kind of, you know, get a nice ribeye. Can you smell that? Burnt offering before the Lord. Sweet smelling sacrifice to me. And when you, when you go and, and no one asks, can you tell me what the slaughtering plant looks like? You know why? Because no one, the process is ugly. That's why God does it in the secret place. So that people won't be offended when they see you come out of it later and go, yeah, but I know where you've been. No one goes, look, you wouldn't eat any meat if you knew, if you saw it mass produced, mass slaughtered. But I personally like meat. It's just the way I am. You might not like it. That's okay. I, I think you should eat your vegetables, chicken, right along with your meat. Put it right on the side. I think, you know, I think if God didn't want us to eat meat, he wouldn't make them taste so good. Amen. 
But that's all part of that process for me. And then I begin to communicate. I begin to talk to him about it. I begin to go, God, talk to me. I, want, I know you want to release this in the earth. I begin to pray. I begin to offer up my intercession for it. And then I say this too, Lord, whatever you need to do in me so I can carry it out there, work it now in me. And it doesn't happen in one day, by the way. Sometimes it's a year. Sometimes it's longer. Sometimes it's not as long. Sometimes God can speak to me in the night and I can come and I can release it in the church the next day and it explodes. Part of that also has to deal with the hunger where the people are at. I can go some places talk about the prophetic and I just, it, it's boring to me because they're not hungry for it. And it's like, I, I'm just, I just don't want to have to sit there and pound the wall. But if they're hungry, I'll be there for four hours prophesying over people. I don't mind that. I rather, I actually, I prefer that. In India, when me and Todd went in India, I was always, I was always like, I'll go lay hands on them. I lay hands on everybody. It's like 10,000 people. I'll lay hands on all of them. If they're that hungry, I'll lay hands on them. They're like, Pastor, they will throng you. Let them throng. It's all right. I should lay hands on them. And so we're praying for the deaf mute. We watched God open up the ears and tongue of 10 people in a row. Me and Todd both got a word knowledge about the deaf. And so right here, he got the word knowledge. I had already written down the word knowledge. Todd, call him up. And he did. And so all these, uh, we were surprised. There was 10 of them. I mean, in America, I've never met a deaf mute. There's 10 in one meeting. Because it's the demonic spirit. So me and Todd start praying, and we get to about six, and, and I'm like, let me start praying for, they went, oh, the pastor comes up, will you pray for the kids? I go, all right. They just start passing the kids over the banister. They're just passing it to me. All I'm going, Jesus, Jesus. You know, this is about all I got time to do is just lay hands on them. Pass them off. And I put this one kid down and the pastor screams. I go, what's the matter? He goes, he was crippled. I got the picture of the boy standing next to me like this, walking. God's good. God wasn't confirming me. He was confirming what we preached. Wasn't, that wasn't confirmation of who I am. It's a confirmation of who he is. While we were there, we had over 10,000 saved. At least 2,000 tumors disappeared. We don't know. They, the pastor finally stopped counting. And he said, because we did like nine meetings. He said, the first meeting, he said, so many reports of tumors disappeared. By the way, this pastor has 60,000 people at 200 different satellite churches around India and some of the other nations. So they were all like watching us, you know, listening to us. So we couldn't even... You know, you have an altar call and he has all these, he has a TV screen. There's like four of the churches on there at one time and you watch him click through and the whole altars are filled on each one of them. You know, you can't even number how many people are saved. <clears throat> There's 10,000 people there on a Sunday and 4,000 don't believe in, you know, like, you know 4,000 don't believe in Jesus yet. Hmm. India's only got about 16% Christian out of 1.2 billion or 1.3 billion people. There are a lot of people you can preach to. I had a kid who got completely was demonized from his birth and he comes up and grabs the microphone from Todd and he starts testifying. The parents go, he says the voices are gone. It was the first time he was in his right mind. He's 14, completely delivered. And we couldn't even touch him. He was so hot. I got a picture of that. He was so hot. We wouldn't even, we just said, we're not touching the glory. We, we, it was so hot. We just said, just let him be. had the man in the, in, the, in the ambulance. And I'm praying for people because I'm praying for everybody. And they take Todd outside. There's an ambulance here. There's a daughter whose father was um, in a coma for four months and the doctors gave up and said, it's time to pull him off life support. Just let him go. And she said, no, I'm taking him to this meeting. And so she brought him in the ambulance on life support, the back of the ambulance. And all of a sudden I get yanked and, Ernest goes, Todd needs you out in the ambulance. Todd wants you outside. I get up in there. It's on video. We prayed for him once. His eyes fluttered. We prayed for him again. His eyes opened up and closed. We prayed for him again. And as he came awake, and by then they're going, you need to leave. And we go, why? He says, here comes the crowd. 
when this gets out, 50,000 people will be around you and they will arrest you. They will, they will get you. Like we, you know, cause we were, well, hi India. We weren't supposed to be there. And, um, they did find out we were there after that, and they started tracking us and trying to find out where we were preaching. <clears throat> we go to a church on a Friday morning, and this is where the boy was healed. There's 10,000 people sitting on the floor. Four, five, six thousand are Hindus. They come for healing prayer on Friday morning. And they just get two, three thousand of them give their life to Jesus. Multitudes get healed. That, and you know me, I'm praying for them all. Just laying hands on them. I'll, I'll lay hands on everybody. If you had told me 30 years ago that God could use me like that, I wouldn't have believed you. I was wrong. Who are you to tell God that he can't raise you up and use you? God makes no junk in his house. You are earthen vessels filled with his glory. You might not go to India. I get that. I get that. India was a last minute trip. I wasn't planning in the end. Todd needed someone to go with him. Asked, you know, said, can you go? I said, yeah, I can go. We were under spiritual warfare the whole nine days and it was glorious. God wants to use you, but he wants you to draw close to him. Why? As you draw close, can I just flow with the anointing a little bit? As you draw close, God just wants to, Jesus just wants to take the anointing off his head. And he just wants to smirk. He just wants to rub the fresh anointing from his very latest head, you know, hot. Fresh anointing from his presence. He just wants to anoint you. You know, you. He, I was the most shocked person. I'm still a little shocked by it. I just don't believe humility anymore is saying, oh God, I'm not worthy. I was unworthy. But a son is worthy. A son is worthy of all that the father has for him. That is the beauty of Christ. That we are worthy of everything. Not because we have spotless, flawless character. God, no. Not because we think perfectly. Oh, God, no. Not because we do everything perfectly. Oh, no, no, no. But because we're his sons and daughters. Everything you see created was created for the son. And that's why you've become joint heirs with everything that was created for the son. Hey, Denise, you feeling that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, just a little bit more. Who's hungry in here? Who's hungry? Just begin to worship him. Just close your eyes and just worship him. I mean, this is like fire right here. Denise is not the one who normally responds this way. She's not the one. This is why I know this is happening to her because this is not normal for Denise to, to get so broken. Doesn't mean she's not anointed. It's just, huh. It's just God's touching her and, you know. I, I will make this promise to everyone who comes to the gate. I have sworn to the Lord that I give myself to him and to the people to pour out everything on my life until the day I die so that 
all of you can reach your potential in Christ, which I far hope is past mine. I, I certainly hope you exceed because where I had to break through a lot of things, hopefully you won't have to. Whether you're young and old, whether rich or poor, by the way, I don't care if you're male or female, but if you are male, you're a male. If you're a female, you're a female. We ain't playing that game here. God doesn't make mistakes. I'll break that spirit off you if you'd like me to. God will free you up from, from that. We don't have to play that game. I promise to, to humbly be before God, but I, am, I, I cannot do it alone. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. Maybe you're going somewhere else. That's okay. Maybe you're hungry for something more. Maybe God's stirring in you something. For me, I can't help but to give myself to him who died for me. And draw close to him who wants me. I'm going to pray for everybody. So, everyone happy? I know, I think you're supposed to do the offering this morning, but you, you don't care if I just take up the offering. <laughs> Faithful. Jeremy and Carrie are faithful sons of the house, daughters of the house. And we're going to ordain them soon, ordain him soon. We're going to ordain them. We're going to, we're going to lay hands on our elders, Sammy and Trish. I'm just waiting for the spirit to say go. And sometimes, you know, I, I know I'm going to do it. I just don't know when. And that's, um, but I also want to make time for his parents to come if we're going to ordain him because his father's a minister. And I would like his father to lay hands on with us and impart to him as well. So I don't take that lightly. I, I, I want to include his parents as Kathy's parents were present when we got ordained. So I, I would really love uh, to be able to do that. So I have to plan that a little bit. But let's take up the offering. Um, I hope you don't mind that I didn't do this in order. And the reason I, I look, I just got to flow with the spirit. If you'll give me that liberty to just flow, we'll be good. All right. I, I just not good with stopping the Holy Ghost when I can't do that. <clears throat> Remember Friday night on the, uh, the 9th, 7 o'clock, be at my house, park on the even side of the road. That's the kind of deal. Just so we only have cars on one side of the road. It makes it easier for people going through the neighborhood. Don't park on anyone's front yard. If you get out of your car and you find yourself on the grass of my neighbor, move your car. <laughs> get it off the grass. By the way, because we have sprinklers. All of us have sprinklers near the road, and people just don't get that. And I've, I've replaced a couple of my neighbors already, so... Um, I don't want, you know, I don't mind doing it, but it wasn't from us. Someone else had done it, but I just saw it blowing out one day and I told her, I said, I'll take care of it. I went and got a sprinkler and changed it for her. But, um, so don't, don't, don't do that. Um, and then seven o'clock, put a, if you have one of those baseball chairs, just keep it in your trunk. And if you come back there and we're filled, then you can go back and get it and bring, or you could bring it and just set it there if we need it. We have about 15 chairs. So if there's more than that. Uh, we were almost full this last week. So we're just expecting more. And then we, we worship, we pray, we, we talk about the priesthood, and then I lay hands on. And what my goal is to create a company of priests who can know how to uh, go into the courts and we begin to order the affairs over this region with God. Because it's not good enough just to have a church. We are to be ordering the affairs over our region. And the hour has come that we're supposed to start training in that. So um, how many people, that's something that interests you? You won't get there in one service or one meeting. This is a process. And um, I haven't arrived. I don't think you can. But um, I don't think there's an arriving. Uh, but I think there is a maturing. So we're going to be doing that. So take up the offering. If you're going to give by check or cash, uh, raise your hand if you need an envelope. Uh, check, write it out to the gate. If you need, you can do the app, which we love. Uh, if you don't have the app and you're not on there, download it, the gate uh, uh, church Jacksonville, um, and just has our logo. So just make sure you get the right one. Otherwise you're giving to some other church. Um, 
I've, I've been given to the church. Oh, that's the wrong logo. Um, appreciate that. Um, but uh, yeah, so you can use the app. You also go to the website, which takes you to the same place, uh, thegatejacks.com if you're watching us online. All right, enough of that said. Um, I'm going to pray because I want those people online to um, um, catch something too. And if you've been putting up with me talking this long, you deserve uh, a blessing in that. Um, <laughs> man, somebody, you know, um, uh, we'll say a blessing over you. Um, so um, let me pray. And then while I'm praying, if you want to come up and uh, start lining up, just leave the video so they can see. I'm going to move my stuff out of the way so that the women come first uh, so the men can catch. If you're not able to catch men, don't worry about it. But we have some ushers that will catch, and we want to make sure they do that. So line up this way. I'm going to pray for them. But by the way, why I am uh, praying, if you want to receive, you can. Okay. Why wait? Yes. Why wait? Um, where's, where'd Bill go? Oh, let me put on some music and... It's ready. That's my bill. Bill's another faithful son of the house and serves us faithfully. Uh, We couldn't do a lot of stuff without the worship team and how they come so faithfully uh, every week after week and week and set the stuff up. And um, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. Listen to me on Facebook. I'm going to pray for you. But it's not isolated them, so everyone can have some. Uh, Father, I thank you right now, Father. As we stand before you in your holy place. Father, I release to all those who hear my voice. That which you have freely given to me. By the laying on of hands. And by prophecy. That which has been imparted to me. By ministers from around the world. That which I've captured in the secret place, I release to those who hear my voice. And I ask that you release to them right now the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wow, there it goes. And quick understanding. So that their hearts may be illuminated with the revelation and knowledge of your son, Jesus. I thank you for it. Let the journey begin. Draw us close and draw closer to us as we as your priest draw near to you. I thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Okay, Bill, thank you.